So there's an update in the case in West Virginia where the judge ordered a party in a divorce proceeding to turn over some property. And then when the property wasn't turned over, the judge kind of on their own took themselves and the parties to that person's house. Mr. Gibson, I think his name was. You might have heard of this story both in the news and on the Civil Rights Lawyer YouTube channel. I'll put a bubble in the corner for you to visit. The I believe the lawyer that's actually representing Mr. Gibson. Let's take a look at what the opinion and order has to say because they tell the whole story from beginning to end, including why they are denying judicial immunity to the judge. Now, judicial immunity is actually even more immunity than qualified immunity. Judicial immunity is usually absolute, and there's almost nothing you can do to lose judicial immunity. So here is a remarkable case where a judge managed to lose judicial immunity. On September 18th, 2018, Mr. Gibson appeared before family court judge Louise Goldston in his divorce action. Judge Goldston granted the party's divorce and adopted their property settlement agreement. So far, normal. On September 26, 2019, Kyle Lusk, the attorney for Mr. Gibson's soon-to-be ex-wife, filed a petition for contempt, alleging defects in the property disbursement. So Mr. Gibson's accused of not turning over some property. On March 4, 2020, a hearing was held on this contempt petition. Judge Goldston, sua sponte, or on her own, halted the hearing, requested Mr. Gibson's home address, and ordered the parties to reconvene at Mr. Gibson's home in 10 minutes, without explanation as to why the home visit was necessary. On the approximately 10-minute drive from the courthouse to Mr. Gibson's home, Mr. Gibson and his girlfriend, Sharon uh, Majul, researched how to move to disqualify Judge Goldston. Upon arrival at the home, Mr. Gibson and Ms. Majewell began video recording. Mr. Gibson then immediately approached Judge Goldston and moved to disqualify her on the grounds that she had become a potential witness. Judge Goldston denied the motion as untimely. Mr. Gibson informed Judge Goldston that she was not going inside his house without a search warrant, and she replied, oh yes I will. Judge Goldston continued, let me in that house or the bailiff is going to arrest you for being in direct contempt of court. Judge Goldston admitted to threatening Mr. Gibson with arrest if he refused to allow her and others into his home. Additionally, Bailiff McPeak testified that he witnessed Judge Goldston threaten Mr. Gibson with arrest and that as a sworn on-duty police officer with arrest powers, he would have been obliged to effect the arrest or make the arrest. Judge Goldston realized that Mr. Gibson was attempting to record the interaction. She ordered the recording ceased on the grounds that family court proceedings may not be recorded. They're, they're, they're not in the courtroom anymore. C can you hold court proceedings off of official government property? I don't know. Bailiff McPeak testified that he was standing with Judge Goldston and Mr. Gibson in the front yard near the gazebo when Judge Goldston ordered him to take possession of Mr. Gibson's cell phone. Based upon her belief, he was yet attempting to record audio. Judge Goldston told Mr. Gibson to stop recording and directed him to surrender his cell phone to Bailiff McPeak. Mr. Gibson did not consent to the seizure of his cell phone. Bailiff McPeak nevertheless filmed the search of Mr. Gibson's residence using his personal cell phone for the protection of everyone involved, including at one point filming the interior of Mr. Gibson's gun safe. Now, back to that whole holding court proceedings. You're not even not on government property anymore. You're on someone's private property. I don't... I, is that a taking under the Fifth Amendment's takings clause? Because you've had a physical intrusion onto your property by the government without proper compensation. That's, that's a taking as well. Judge Goldston was unaware until after the incident that Bailiff McPeak was recording. After he disclosed to Judge Goldston that he had recorded the incident, Judge Goldston told him that recording was improper and he should not do it again. Before seizing Mr. Gibson's cell phone, Bailiff McPeak radioed for backup law enforcement assistance. Before the backup arrived, Judge Goldston, Bailiff McPeak, Mr. Lusk, and Mr. Gibson's ex-wife 
entered Mr. Gibson's residence and began searching. What? <laughs> I would, I would want to, I'd be going to jail for all the other reasons that I'm not going to mention on this live stream. I can not only imagine that Mr. Gibson felt super helpless, but that it was like a soul crushing level of helpless. Like these are the people who are supposed to be level headed. The judge is supposed to be neutral and unbiased and not supposed to become an aggressor against one of the parties, especially when the most offense Mr. Gibson was accused of was failing to turn over some property. Okay, that's a level of offense. Use your normal contempt powers. Keep it in the courtroom. Order him to pay a fine. Order him to be incarcerated until he turns over the property. And as soon as he turns over the property, he's released. Just to compel the property turnover. So I'm assuming that that's a similar feeling to what Mr. Gibson was feeling as this uh, bailiff and judge and everybody are coming to his house to teach him a lesson uh, about uh, disrespecting the judge by not turning over some property. Kind of a kind of a overreaction on the judge's part. Well, let's see what happens to the judge as we keep going. Deputy Bobby Stump also aided the search and seizure of the disputed property at the direction of the judge once he arrived at Mr. Gibson's residence. The search lasted approximately 20 to 30 minutes and involved various parts of the house. Many different items of personal property were seized from Mr. Gibson's residence without his consent, only some of which were later returned. Law enforcement created no contemporaneous inventory of the items taken or any police report. What? What kind of messed up kid show is this police department running that you're taking property, you're seizing assets, and you're not inventorying and cataloging, and maybe even like photographing everything that you take as if it's either evidence or at least seized property? Why would you not do that? I, I mean, yes, we all know laziness, incompetence, uh, <laughs> I, the, the, you know, this was different than the normal procedures, so they just didn't. It's some kind of lack of foresight or forward thinking or training or incompetence. When a small portion of video footage of the aforementioned events was publicized, the Judicial Disciplinary Council received two complaints against Judge Goldston. On September 18th, 2020, the West Virginia Judicial Investigation Commission issued a formal statement of charges filed with the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia, which revealed Judge Goldston admitted to conducting similar home visits in her capacity as family court judge on at least 11 separate occasions. She ultimately reached a settlement with the Judicial Disciplinary Council. She admitted her wrongdoing and agreed to recommend to the Judicial Hearing Board in the Supreme Court of Appeals that she be censured and fined $5,000 as an appropriate sanction for her violations. That is BS. That a judge could conduct home visits, ultra v race, outside of her power using her power as a family court judge on at least 11 occasions. And she gets a slap on the wrist, a public censure, which is just a public slap on the wrist and a $5,000 fine. So that's nothing. That's, that's, that's nothing. That's saying it's okay to do this because we won't punish you. Now, what could happen is all of those 11 violations, those parties could sue the judge now knowing that you can probably get past her judicial immunity. But how many of those people are actually going to want to sue a judge knowing that the judge is likely where they live? Most of the people are probably residents in the area. And then you sue a family court judge and then that gets out because you've sued a judge. That's going to be in the local paper. That's going to be gossiped about. And now you've got the local sheriff's department that doesn't like you, or the local police department doesn't like you, or the local family court that's going to be overseeing your custody arrangement or your property distribution. Uh, they don't like you anymore. They already didn't like you. Now they especially don't like you. So there's a chilling effect just by 
the nature of complaining about a judge. So good luck getting the other 11, 10 people to sue the judge and bypass that. That's why you need enforcement from the disciplinary commission, not enforcement by civil proceeding, by, by forcing the victims. What should really happen in this lawyer's eyes is the judicial disciplinary commission should find those other 10 people and get them some kind of independent counsel to inform them of their rights and offer to sue on behalf you know, of those people, maybe make it some kind of an anonymous proceeding so that you know only the, the parties know who's involved, have some kind of confidentiality order, and allow those people a chance to sue, give them a chance to sue. Otherwise, it really comes off as a super biased thing. Rant over. On March 22nd, 2021, Mr. Gibson initiated this action against Judge Goldston, Bailiff McPeak, Deputies White and Stump, Mr. Lusk, and the Raleigh County Commission pursuant to 42 U.S.C. 1983, the Civil Rights Statute, and the First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendments, so uh, freedom of speech or association violation there, um, search and seizure violation there against the state there. He asserts that, one, the search and seizure of the suspected marital property violated his Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable search and seizure. Also, the restriction of Mr. Gibson and Ms. Majewell's recordings and the seizure of Mr. Gibson's cell phone to prevent further recording violated his First Amendment right to free speech and access to information about officials' public activities. Three, the assistance provided to Judge Goldston by the Raleigh County Sheriff's Office in the search and seizure, that that constituted an official policy, custom, and practice of the Raleigh County Commission. Four, the search and seizure of Mr. Gibson's property deprived him of his due process rights, so they were, he was deprived of property without first having you know, due process, notice, an opportunity to respond, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's, his property was just seized, and then he dealt with it later in court. Five, Judge Goldston's home search policy disadvantaged litigants, including pro se litigants like Mr. Gibson, in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and West Virginia state law. And six, the long-term practice agreement relationship and understanding between Mr. Lusk and Judge Goldston related to searches and seizures of marital property in contempt proceedings constituted a conspiracy or concerted action under color of state law to deprive Mr. Gibson of his federally protected rights. Mr. Gibson requests compensatory and punitive damages as well as reasonable attorney's fees and costs, injunctive and declaratory relief, and any other relief that the court deems is just and fair. April 19th, 2021, all defendants moved to dismiss. Thereafter, the Supreme Court of Appeals concluded that Judge Goldston exceeded her judicial powers in searching Mr. Gibson's residence in violation of the Code of Judicial Conduct. A censure and fine resulted. The undersigned ordered supplemental briefing by Judge Goldston and Mr. Gibson as to any effect the ruling might have on these proceedings. They filed a supplemental memorandum December of 2021. The parties moved for summary judgment. The court denied all motions except to dismiss defendant Kyle Lusk. He was dismissed by agreement or stipulation. So the court now goes over the summary judgment standard. Basically, we want summary judgment when there is no issue to be resolved by a jury or by a fact finder. So that's the moving party, the requesting party requesting summary judgment must show that there is no genuine dispute as to any material or important fact that must be found by a jury. And that assuming those facts are as the movement says, then judgment must follow by operation of law, as a matter of law. The burden is on the non-moving party to show that there is an issue for trial, that you must go to a trier of fact, a finder of fact, that the jury will have to hear testimony and determine the credibility of witnesses, etc. Or, if there's no genuine issue for trial, then we can decide the thing on the papers. That's summary judgment. Mr. Gibson pled five counts against Judge Goldston, all pursuant to the 1983 civil rights statute. Judge Goldston moved to summary judgment claiming judicial immunity. Mr. Gibson contends her actions herein constitute a non-judicial act for which no absolute immunity applies. 
Judicial immunity is a form of absolute immunity. Like other forms of official immunity, judicial immunity is an immunity from suit, not just from ultimate assessment of damages. Although unfairness and injustice to a litigant may result on occasion, it is a general principle of the highest importance to the proper administration of justice that a judicial officer, in exercising the authority vested in him or her, shall be free to act upon his own convictions, without apprehension of personal consequences to himself. Judicial immunity is not overcome by allegations of bad faith or of malice, the existence of which ordinarily cannot be resolved without engaging in discovery and eventual trial. Judicial immunity is justified and defined by the functions it protects and serves, not by the person to whom it attaches. A litany of Supreme Court cases establishes that the immunity is overcome only in two sets of circumstances. First, a judge is not immune from liability for non-judicial actions, i.e., actions not taken in the judge's judicial capacity. Second, a judge is not immune for actions, though judicial in nature, taken in the complete absence of all jurisdiction. Whether an act by a judge is a judicial one relates to the nature of the act itself, i.e. whether it is a function normally performed by a judge, and to the expectations of the parties, i.e. whether they dealt with the judge in his judicial capacity. It is the nature of the function performed, not the identity of the actor who performed it, that informs our immunity analysis. Further, it is not the particular act in question that is scrutinized, otherwise any mistake of a judge in excess of his authority would become a non-judicial act, because an improper or erroneous act cannot be said to be normally performed by a judge. For instance, the Supreme Court determined that a circuit court judge who approved a mother's petition to have a tubal ligation, have her tubes tied, uh, she'll be sterile, performed on her minor daughter without the daughter's knowledge or consent, was entitled to judicial immunity. The High Court reasoned that judges not infrequently are called upon in their official capacity to approve petitions relating to the affairs of minors. And the judge was acting as a county circuit court judge when he approved the petition. Similarly, a California Superior Court judge was angered when a public defender failed to appear in court on time because he was delayed in a proceeding in another courtroom. The judge directed police officers to use excessive force to remove the attorney from the other courtroom and bring the attorney before him. That sounds like a fun case to cover on Lawful Masses. In determining that the judge's actions were judicial and therefore covered under absolute immunity, the Supreme Court reasoned that although the judge directing the officers to use excessive force was in excess of his authority, the act of directing an officer to bring counsel to court is judicial in nature. Thus, the particular act in question was the judge's direction to police officers to carry out a judicial order with excessive force. The Supreme Court, however, did not analyze that particular act, but rather analyzed the particular act's relation to a general function normally performed by a judge, in this case the function of directing police officers to bring counsel in a pending case before the court. The High Court also emphasized that it was of no importance that the judge's order was carried out by police officers because it is the nature of the function performed, not the identity of the actor who performed it, that informs our immunity analysis. The court determined that the act, ordering police officers to use excessive force to bring a lawyer before the court, was a judicial one, and thus judicial immunity applied. The crux of Judge Goldston's argument here is that her actions were taken during the course of adjudicating a family court dispute. She contends that, assuming she exceeded her authority, her actions still were judicial in nature and hence subject to judicial immunity. As noted above, the court examines the nature of the act and not the actor. The nature of the act was a warrantless search of Mr. Gibson's residence and a warrantless seizure of his property. The twofold inquiry is, one, whether the search of the residence was an act normally performed by a judge, and two, the expectations of the parties, namely whether Mr. Gibson was dealing with Judge Goldston in her judicial capacity. Respecting the first prong, does a judge normally execute a search warrant or personally search a residence? To quote Judge Posner, to ask the question is pretty much to answer it. While the 
issuance of a search warrant is unquestionably a judicial act. The execution of a search and seizure is not. Indeed, searches are so quintessentially executive in nature that a judge who participates in one acts not as a judicial officer, but as an adjunct law enforcement officer. So the judge is crossing from the judicial branch into the executive branch. We don't do that. While the Logi sales case did not address judicial immunity, the Supreme Court expressed that a judicial officer presiding over a criminal case who personally conducted a generalized search of a store under authority of an invalid search warrant was not acting as a judicial officer, but as an adjunct law enforcement officer. Judge King observed likewise in writing for the panel in United States v. Servants, stating it is elementary that a judge can overstep his responsibilities and compromise his judicial neutrality if, by way of example, he serves as a leader of a search party. Judge Goldston was not engaged in an act normally performed by a judge. Respecting the second prong, Mr. Gibson doubtless dealt with Judge Goldston in her judicial capacity at the outset of the March 4th contempt hearing. The situation changed markedly, however, once the field trip began. Once Judge Goldston invited herself to the residence, began her warrantless search, and then seized private property, the die was cast. Nevertheless, Judge Goldston notes, 1. A bailiff was in attendance, 2. The search was recorded, much like a judicial proceeding, and 3. Mr. Gibson and his ex-wife made motions during the process. She asserts all of this demonstrates the parties dealt with her as a judge. These contentions do not withstand minimal scrutiny. Mr. Gibson's motion for disqualification arose out of Judge Goldston acting as a witness rather than a judge. Further, the recording of the search, which Judge Goldston attempted to halt, is in no way equivalent factually or legally to an electronically transcribed or recorded judicial proceeding. Judge Goldston recognized as much in her later deposition. Judge Goldston has thus failed to demonstrate either of the two required prongs. Her protestation that this case is in the same category as others also misses the mark. In the Muriela's case, the judge ordered the bailiff to bring an attorney before him and ordered excessive force be used in the process. However, the underlying action of compelling counsel to appear was within the judicial orbit. And while Judge Goldston might similarly have had the authority to order a search of litigants' home and a seizure of certain items, she could not conduct the search and seizure herself. If the judicial officer in Muriellis used excessive force himself to bring the attorney before him, a different result might obtain. A reductive analysis by the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit is helpful. The analytical key between functions for which judicial immunity attaches and those for which it does not is the determination whether the questioned activities are truly judicial acts or acts that simply happen to have been done by judges. Judge Goldston's actions fall into the latter category. She performed a non-judicial act and she is not entitled to judicial immunity. Moreover, it appears Judge Goldston acted in clear absence of all jurisdiction. As our Court of Appeals observed decades ago, the dividing line between unprotected usurpations of power on the one hand and protected mistaken exercises of limited power on the other is divined by answering a single question. When a judge exceeds authority, was she entirely devoid of power and hence deprived of immunity, or was a power lawfully possessed? but wrongfully exercised, in which case immunity holds. In arriving at the answer, the Supreme Court of Appeals disciplinary rulings against Judge Goldston emphasized how far she exceeded her warrant. And although the decision necessarily post-dated her actions herein, the Supreme Court of Appeals concluded the restrictive and textual constitutional markers were long in place prior to her unlawful actions. They wrote, to say that searches are an executive activity is to announce no new principle of law. The United States Supreme Court assumed as much in 1979 when it rejected a conviction resulting from a search led by a town justice. According to the Supreme Court, the town justice in question allowed himself to become a member, if not the leader, 
of a search party, which was essentially a police operation. Under our system of government, judges may not exercise executive powers. The West Virginia Constitution declares that the legislative, executive, and judicial departments shall be separate and distinct. The Constitution further specifies, in unmistakable terms, that no department shall exercise the powers properly belonging to either of the others, and forbids any person to exercise the powers of more than one of them at the same time. In light of these clear prohibitions, we hold that the West Virginia Constitution forbids a judicial officer to participate in a search, because a search is an exercise of executive power. So the court then denies Judge Goldston's motion for summary judgment and moves on to Mr. Gibson's motion against Judge Goldston. So the court says that there are issues of material fact for a trier of fact to determine and therefore Mr. Gibson's motion for summary judgment is denied. And then they just move right on to the county defendants and the county parties are going on to trial as well. They're going to argue over whether there is a policy or custom that the violation resulted from a policy statement, ordinance, regulation, or decision officially adopted and promulgated by the county's officers. So that will be something they go to trial on. Then we have the First Amendment claims against the bailiff, Bailiff McPeak and Deputy Stump. They assert qualified immunity. So we know what qualified immunity is. It protects police officers who are performing their duties, acting within the scope of their duties, and it gives them basically immunity from suit. So they go through the clearly established rights analysis, and they are testing whether or not a citizen has a right to record the police. The right to record in general is clearly established, but they are still looking for more specificity. The court should identify the right at issue at a high level of particularity. The clearly established inquiry must be undertaken in light of the specific context of the case, not as a broad general proposition. And then they say, a reasonable law enforcement officer in Bailiff McPeak's position could not be expected to have known his conduct violated Mr. Gibson's First Amendment rights. The subject right, properly framed, is whether a citizen suffers a First Amendment deprivation when a bailiff, acting on a direct judicial order, seizes that citizen's phone while the citizen is attempting to record what the bailiff perceived as an ongoing court proceeding. Had Bailiff McPeak not complied with the order, he would doubtless have been held in contempt or dismissed. The Qualified Immunity Doctrine does not require one in Bailiff McPeak's position to make a correct and somewhat esoteric on-the-spot legal analysis of whether a judge's order is legally correct. The court consequently concludes that Bailiff McPeak is entitled to qualified immunity. The court grants in part the Raleigh County Defendant's motion for summary judgment as to Mr. Gibson's First Amendment claim against Bailiff McPeak. On to the Fourth Amendment claim, again analyzed in light of the specific context of the case. Do citizens have a clearly established right to be free from warrantless searches and seizures? The court is unable, however, to find authority analogous to the present situation where officers participate in a warrantless search and seizure when a judge is physically present and personally directing the effort. The question again arises whether a reasonable person in the official's position could have failed to appreciate that his conduct would violate the right at issue. Further existing precedent must have placed the statutory or constitutional question beyond debate. The court here, is unable to conclude that reasonable law enforcement officers positioned akin to Bailiff McPeak and Deputy Stump would have known that their conduct, that is, following Judge Goldston's orders and participating in the search and seizure that she directed, would violate Mr. Gibson's Fourth Amendment rights. So, summary judgment is granted in part there. So it looks like the major holding of this decision is that Judge Goldston has lost her judicial immunity for conducting an extrajudicial search and seizure, but that her officers thought that they were acting in, the, in their capacity as officers of the court, and therefore they are still entitled to qualified immunity. And I, I, I kind of agree with that result. I, I, don't, I don't like it. I, don't, I honestly think that there should be scorched earth when 
a government official clearly violates the rights of a citizen. Think of it this way. If Mr. Gibson had brought a search party to Judge Goldston's house and forced their way in under color of law and searched her property, people could have been killed. Police would have come, SWAT teams would have come, a judge would have been under siege by some crazy citizen. But when we flip the positions, but the facts are the same, suddenly Mr. Gibson is supposed to behave and submit and not fight the judge physically, violently, with lethal force. <laughs> and somehow that's normal and okay. In my humble opinion, the judge should really have had the hammer brought down on them because this could have been a deadly situation that would have been the judge's fault. I don't know, maybe I'm just maybe I'm just old school or maybe I'm wrong. You just you let me know. I just don't think if the if this if the script was flipped, you know, are, are the situations and the outcomes equal? If the script was flipped, would the outcome have been the same? Would Mr. Gibson have gotten publicly censured, kept his job even though he's done this 11 times, gotten a $5,000 fine? and lost judicial immunity. I don't think so. I think if the script was flipped, Mr. Gibson would have been shot and would be either dead or in jail. I think that's what would have happened. So when the judge does it, why doesn't the judge go to jail? Because it's not equal. We don't live in an equal and fair society. You, you let me know what you think about that. Maybe I'm maybe I'm off the rails. You let me know. Those, those are my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my top supporters in the month of July, John Steele, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Shadow Tycho, Gut Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, Wyatt Calandro, and King Ares. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJFrench, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for my weekly live production stream on Twitch.tv slash Lawful Masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye. And you might have seen this on the Civil Rights Lawyer YouTube channel. I'll put a... Whoops. <laughs> well, I've got to fix that now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just screwed up my microphone. <laughs> and then I start that section over. Yeah, I think we're good now. All right. That was fun. <laughs>